Holy Spirit rain down. Hallelujah. Oh, rain down. Oh, comforter and friend. How we need your touch to care. Yes, Lord. Stand on your word, Holy Spirit, hear Oh, rain down, oh, Holy Spirit, rain, rain down, oh, rain down, oh, comforter. Stand on your word, Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. He's here because he said he would be. Amen. We just appreciate his presence so much. We appreciate him being faithful to his word. Amen. We believe by faith. That wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be in their midst. Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn while we're standing to Proverbs chapter 31. We want to welcome back all the youth from Arizona who was at Evening Light Fellowship. You can probably tell who they were. They're a little redder than when they left. But God bless you all. It's good to have you back. Amen. And we, we just trust and believe that you brought back some of the atmosphere from camp so we can lick a little honey off of you today. Amen. So just keep pulling. I want to take a look here at a subject uh, I just want to call a, a virtuous bride. I want to read a couple of scriptures and I want to do a little bit of a word study this evening if we could. Proverbs 31 and 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Who can find a virtuous woman? What a question. For her price is far above rubies. Let's go over to, to verse, or chapter 12, Proverbs chapter 12, we'll read one more verse while you're standing. Proverbs 12 and verse 4. Proverbs 12 and 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord Jesus, as we look into your word, Lord, that you would open the word unto us, that you would break the bread of life, that you would remove the scales from our eyes, Lord, and give us a spirit of revelation that we might see your word as you intend for it to be seen. Quicken it to us, Lord. Awaken in us, Lord, that all the desire of our heart feed us on your word this evening, Lord. We give you first place tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can all have your seats. I, I want to look at this word that we just read for virtuous in Proverbs 31, when it says, who can find a virtuous woman? And also in Proverbs 12, verse 4, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. I want to look at this word virtuous because it doesn't necessarily mean what, at a first reading, that you might think that it means. Uh, you know, when, sometimes when we look at this, uh, we know that, and we'll get to it in a minute in the book of Ruth, that Boaz says, uh, you know, the whole city does know that thou art a virtuous woman. But, but the word virtuous doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily mean that she's moral or that she's clean or holy. That's not what virtuous means. It has a different meaning altogether. And if you look at the, the Hebrew word, and uh, it's uh, kail, kail, and it's spelled C-H-A-Y-I-L. If you're taking notes, I'll give it to you again. C-H-A-Y-I-L. 
Kyle, Kyle, I think that's how you pronounce it, but it's probably not even close to that. But anyways, that'll work for us tonight. When you look at this word, this word is used in the, in the Old Testament 232 times. So it's a word that's used throughout the Old Testament, and it's only ever used virtuous in these three places that we're talking about. And the word means strength, might, efficiency, wealth, or an army. Now this is a lot different than what we first think of when we read this, who can find a virtuous woman. You're talking about strength and might, it could be wealth, or it could mean an army. This same exact word is interpreted army, let me see here, 56 times in the Old Testament. 56 times it's army. 37 times it's men of valor or man of valor. 29 times it's interpreted host, like the host of Israel or the host of uh, Pharaoh's army. It's, it means an army or a force. 14 times it's interpreted force or forces. 13 times it's interpreted valiant. 12 times it's interpreted strength. Nine times it's interpreted power. Might, six times. Strong, five times. 11 times riches, 10 times wealth. I think we're starting to see a picture. This doesn't mean that she's just a moral woman, although you have to be strong to be a moral woman. It doesn't just mean that she's clean living. This is a strong woman. This is a force, amen? This is, this is not just a, a, a woman who's lived clean. This is a force, amen? The, the Strong's definition means a force, whether of men, means, or other resources. It's a force. In the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon, it's, in, it, it's definition is strength, power, might, and in parentheses next to might it says especially warlike. Amen. We're talking about a woman. Strength, power, might, especially warlike, and valor. That's how the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon uses the definition of that. So we're talking about a force, and I want to look at this a, a couple places in the scripture. Let's go to Joshua together, and we'll read just a couple scriptures. Joshua 10. Joshua 10 and verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor... Now that phrase, men of valor, is this exact same Hebrew word, kayil, men of valor. And men of valor is interpreted there, but in other places it's virtuous woman. Virtuous woman and men of valor is the same exact Hebrew word. Hallelujah. We're going to paint a real neat picture here of the bride because the bride is not going to be a timid little scared creature, but she's going to understand the word of God. She is going to be the very reflection. She's going to be the very uh, picture of Christ in a body at the end time. And it's not just that she's clean, she will be clean. Not just that she's moral, she will be moral, but she will be a force upon the earth. Strong, a force. Amen. Might, especially warlike. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's go over to Judges. Next book over, Judges chapter 6. In verse 12, I'm trying my best to slow down because I want to just fill in some of the gaps. Sunday, I think we just go so fast so many times. We skip so much stuff, so I want to just take some time on a Wednesday night and just do a word study. But we'll see what happens. You keep pulling, we might just fly high and never land again. And I like that too. Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. This is Gideon as he's threshing out wheat to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That term man of valor is interpreted man of valor from this same word, kail, which is interpreted virtuous when it refers to the virtuous woman in Proverbs, amen. 
So now we see how that word is used elsewhere. So many times it's army when it's talking about the armies of Israel or the army of Nebuchadnezzar coming up against Jerusalem or if it's the army of Pharaoh, it's the same exact word. So we realize now it's a strength, it's might, it's a force. Amen. So now let's turn to the book of uh, uh, Ruth. Next book over. I tried to put these in order so it's easy. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. We can just keep turning to the right. Ruth, chapter 2. Now, I want to look at Ruth, chapter 1, for just a second. Verse 11. Now, we know, that we know the story quite well, so I'm just going to try to hit just some high spots here and not really dive in too deep, but... but we know that, that Naomi and her husband and her sons had left the land and they married women in Moab, Moab Moabitish women, and that the sons had died and the husband had died. And now Naomi is speaking to her daughters-in-law. And in verse 11, she said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and or Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and, they God, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, shall I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Hallelujah. That's not a timid spirit. Amen. Let's go over to chapter 2 and look at verse 1. Now that we know that they return into the land and, 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 and Ruth is going to go out trying to make a living for her and her mother-in-law by threshing out barley. They return at the beginning of the barley harvest and in verse 1 it says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth. What do you think this word actually is? It's not wealth. It's Kail, the same word that is interpreted valor, our army, our host, our virtuous, our force, our might. Everywhere else that it's used, it's used these other ways. This is the only time it's ever used this way when it says mighty man of wealth. It could just as easily say mighty man of valor. It's the same exact word. And he says, so now he was, now they're describing this kinsman, there was a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of this word, kail, strength, ability, might, force, or army, amen? The same one that we read interpreted, mighty man of valor. In fact, there's several uh, translations that use it that way. But, but now we want to, I just wanted to write that, or read that so you can see what word is used to describe Boaz, what is Boaz's nature? What is Boaz like? How is Boaz described in the Bible? And they use the same word that's used for virtuous when they refer to virtuous woman, or valor when they refer to a man of war. This is going to be important as we turn over here to chapter 3. We're going to turn over to chapter 3 and look at verse 10. And in this passage of Scripture, she has slipped in at midnight, or she has slipped in at night, and she had laid at the feet of Boaz, according to the instructions Naomi gave her. And now she's laying there, and at midnight he awoke, he was startled. He said, who's there? He said, this is Ruth. And she says, will thou throw thy skirt over me, for thou art a near kinsman? And he responds in verse 10, and he said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in thy latter end than at the beginning. Insomuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. The same word virtuous is the same word over here that's interpreted wealth when referring to Boaz. Now, we know it can't be wealth referring 
to Ruth because Ruth is not wealthy. Is that right? She's poor. She's gleaning in the field, earning out a meager living, just getting enough to sustain day by day. So we know she's not wealthy. But what is she? This scripture tells us that whatever Boaz is, she is also. Amen. Whatever Boaz is, she is. And what was attracting Boaz to her, amen, it wasn't her eye color, amen, it wasn't her hair, amen. There was something that attracted Boaz to this woman. It's because they have the same description, amen. They're made out of the same material. They have the same character. They have the same virtue. The same virtue that she has is the same virtue that Boaz has. Hallelujah. Why is it? Why is it that she would turn, amen, and not go back and seek a husband with her home, not go back to her family and not go back to other gods? What was it that would turn her Naomi's way and choose a life of poverty, choose a life of uncertainty, choose a life, amen, different than the one she was raised? What was it? It was her strength, amen. It was her force. It was that thing that was laying down in her, and I doubt very much she considered herself a strong woman. I don't know, but we know Gideon, when the angel of the Lord came to Gideon, he was threshing wheat over by the wine press to try to hide it from the Midianites who were coming to steal it. He wasn't acting like a mighty man of valor. He was acting like somebody who was afraid that somebody else was going to come and steal his wheat. So he began to thresh it out secretly over by the wine press. He was hiding what he was doing, hiding it because there was a force stronger than him that would come and raid him and take what he had year after year after year. So he was hiding, amen. But then the angel comes because there's always a paradox. The angel comes to the man who's hiding from his enemy, hiding to thresh out wheat, and he begins to identify him with his true nature, not the one he's exhibiting that day, but the one that's in the seed on the inside of him. He begins because why? The messenger always knows what's in you. The angel can always identify who you are and what your character is. You grew up a certain way. Know that now that Gideon grew up a certain way under certain circumstances with certain life experiences that bent him in a certain fashion, a certain mode. And he got in the habit of hiding his threshing. He got in the habit of hiding away what's rightfully his. Hiding on his own land, hiding by the wine press, threshing out secretly. He got in the habit because there was other forces that was mightier than him. There was other men of valor that had more valor than him. He probably didn't consider himself a mighty man of valor while he was hiding to thresh out the wheat. But the messenger knew what his character was. When the message came to you, the messenger began to identify what your character is. You may not have had a clue that you were virtuous, that you were a man or woman of valor. You may have thought you were a poor kid, got kicked around a lot, and things didn't work out in your life, and you've been up and you've been down, but that's not who the angel said you were. Ruth was poor. Ruth was weak. Ruth didn't have any protection. It was her and Naomi. She didn't have land of her own. She didn't have a crop of her own. She didn't have any substance of her own. Everything they had, they walked in with, and what she was doing was just sustaining. She was just getting by day by day. Thresh a little wheat today, or a little barley today, eat it tonight. Thresh a little barley tomorrow, eat it the next night. She was just sustaining life. She was only strong enough for one day at a time. But when Boaz looked at her, he didn't see a poor woman with no strength. He didn't see a poor woman with no ability. He didn't see a poor woman with no means. What he saw was a force, was strength, was might, was the same thing that's in the army and the host he saw in her because he uses the same word to describe her. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope we can identify ourselves in the word. Amen. In the flesh, we're nothing. Amen. What we grew up as is nothing, but there's a seed laying down on the inside, and that seed come from God, and it has the same character that God has. It has the same nature that God has, and if he's strong, you're strong. Amen. Not in your own strength, but in him, you're strong. Amen. His attribute is strong. His character is strength. Amen. He is the mighty one. He is the mighty warrior. He is the force. Amen. He is the strength. He is the might. He is the host. He is the army. 
And everything that he is, she must also be. That's why when Ruth and Boaz come together, it's two of the same nature joining together. He saw in her the same nature. She was attracted to him with the same nature. They were coming together. What was it? Predestination was driving them together. She wasn't looking for youth. She wasn't looking. What was she looking for? She was looking for redemption. And he was strong enough to redeem her. He was in the right position with the right might, with the right force to redeem her. She was looking for redemption. He was looking for character. And those two characters came together. Praise God. Brother Branham says in the message, Kinsman Redeemer, he said, one day while she was out in the field, this rich young man by... By the name of Boaz, a ruler, a wealthy man came by and saw her. And when he saw her, he fell in love with her. He thought she was a wonderful woman. He liked her character. I love that. Look at what he says to her over in chapter 2. In verse 2, she goes into Boaz's field and she begins to reap in verse 4. He says, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto the servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go there after them. Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? See, she didn't have a very high estimation of herself. She didn't feel worthy or capable or deserving in any way. But now look at what Boaz says. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and and art come unto a people which thou knewest not therefore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And she said, why has you taken knowledge of me? Why have you paid any attention to me? Why have you been, had grace upon me? Why would you do this to me? I'm a stranger, and he says, I know your character. I know your virtue. It has been showed unto me all that you did to Naomi, all that you did after the death of your husband. Boaz is attracted not to her facial features, not to her body. He's attracted to her character. Why? He's got the same character. The same word is describing both of them. He's got the character. That's the character he's looking for. Hallelujah. 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 He said, back in Kinsman Redeemer, Brother Bram said he liked her character. You remember he said, I know, and then the people knows that thou art a virtuous woman. Made her decision clean and clear, came right back over and lived just exactly what she said she'd do. That's what Boaz had seen in Ruth, that clean cut decision, that virtue of woman standing there, and he fell in love with her. What was it he loved? That clear-cut decision. This is what I'm going to do. What helped her make that decision? Something predestinated was inside of her, and she was walking in a predestinated plan. She didn't know it. She didn't understand it. But there was a force inside of her. There was virtue inside of her that was driving her to make that clear-cut decision. 
Many of us have had to make a clear-cut decision, and that clear-cut decision has cost us some things in life, amen? Cost us relationships and cost us, amen, the feeling of friends and feeling of family and maybe cost us a great deal, amen? But we made a clear-cut decision, amen? And what is that? What was driving you to that? It wasn't your wisdom. It wasn't your strength. It was a predestinated plan, a seed down on the inside that had to manifest what it was predestinated to manifest. And where did the strength come? come from from there from that source is where the strength come from where does the virtue come from now where's the force where's the strength where is it coming from it's coming from that life on the inside not your human life amen but the life from your new birth that's the life that's leading you in a life of virtue and strength and power hallelujah if it was just the body we were born with, and it was just the spirit we came with, there would be no virtue and strength, but there's something else going on. And what's God looking for? Character. What kind of character? A character that matches his character. He's looking for the same thing Boaz was looking for. He's attracted to the same thing Boaz was attracted to. He, how, why did he show grace? Why did he show grace upon her? Why did he notice her? Why did he pay attention to her? Because it was showed him all that she did when she made her choice and how she acted out her choice. And he loved it. Brother Bram says in Choosing of a Bride, he looks for her character, the character of Christ. Now, just a moment now, that's it. He chooses a bride to reflect his character to which the modern churches of today certainly miss his program here a million miles because they deny this to be the truth. So how could it be? He's looking, he's looking for the day for that bride to be formed, Hebrews 13, 8, just exactly like it was, like he was. It's got to be his same flesh, same bones, same spirit, same everything, just exactly built up, and them two then become one until the church becomes that, they're not one. The character of him the word for this age must be molded. You got that? The character of him, what's the character of him? The word for this age. It's got to be molded. She must be molded like he is. Amen. What was he? He was the word for his day. What must she be? The word for her day. Amen. That's what he's looking for. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Song of Solomon together. Song of Solomon is just after Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, then, well, I think I got that right. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Praise the Lord. Chapter 6. Now, I want to I wanna look at another angle of this same word here, this, this word out of the Hebrew that means man of valor, army, host, forces, and, and take a look at it here. We know Song of Solomon is a love story between Solomon and his bride, and it's written in stanzas. There's many poems that go together, and a lot of it, he is describing her, and she's describing him, and we get into one of these sections when he begins to describe her in chapter six, verse four, and he says, thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Now that's not how I described my wife to get her to love me. You're as terrible as the infantry. You're just as terrible as special forces. That didn't do anything for her. But what he's trying to show is, is she's got strength, amen. She's this virtuous woman that the, the Bible's describing. He goes on to say, Thou art terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as the flock of goats that appear from Gilead. He begins describing her again. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing. There of every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. She has all of her teeth. <laughs> and they're white. She's got long, thick black hair. He's starting to describe her, amen? As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. 
The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? This just isn't just any woman. This is a special woman. In her is, is a unique strength, amen? And she's as terrible as an army with banners. And what's being described here is the love between Christ and his bride, amen? He's trying to describe here in this poem, in this Song of Solomon, trying to describe something for us to catch a vision of this. This bride is an invincible army, amen? She's on the move, she's on the march, amen? What is it? <clears throat> it's strength, it's a force, it's virtue. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Ezekiel 37. We're just going to keep going right. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which is full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter unto you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sin you upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with the skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me prophesy unto the wind. So now there's a prophecy that goes forth, and now the bones come together, the sinew comes upon it, the flesh comes upon it, and the skin comes upon it, but yet there's no breath. So now we have everything that looks like a body, amen? It looks like when Adam was formed, Brother Branham said he was standing there, amen, with his toes in the earth, amen, but he needed something, he needed the breath of life to become a living soul. And they, this army now is built back, but it needs something else. It's inanimate it's not in motion the bones are together the sinew together the flesh is together it's covered over with skin but there has to come another prophecy and with the prophecy comes life amen he said say unto me prophesy unto the wind prophesy son of man and say to the wind thus saith the Lord of God come from the four winds O breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live so I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came unto them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. That word army, you guessed it, the same word as virtuous for virtuous woman, the same word as valor for mighty men of valor. Hallelujah. Brother Branham says in the revelation of Jesus Christ in the church age book, he knows that if the people get the true revelation of the true church, and what she is and what she stands for and that she can do the greater works, she will be an invincible army. Amen. Don't forget, this whole thing started, amen, with a battle in heaven and the battle in heaven moved down to earth and what was a battle in angels came into humans and now the battle is raging here in your mind. She's an army, an invincible army, but not an invincible army that shoots people or stabs them with a sword, amen, or cuts their heads off. This is not a physical thing. This is a spiritual warfare, and it's taking place in our minds. But she's going to be an invincible army in the battle that's raging in the mind. And what's going to make her invincible? A true revelation. 
She's going to understand what the word for her day is telling her who she is and what's happened and the mistake that's been made and how the fall occurred and how the devil tries to get her off the word. She's going to understand and by revelation, she's going to resist that false spirit. Amen. And she's going to be an invincible army, not because of the strength in her arm, not because of the strength in her mind, but by revelation of the word. What revelation? The full revelation of the full word makes her invincible. Hallelujah. Now you know why you have to devour the tapes? Why you have to listen to the tapes and read the books and, and talk about it along the way and meditate it and pray for revelation, all those stuff. Why? Because it's the very thing that makes you invincible. What caused the first fall? First, there had to be a conception in the mind before the act ever took place. And that's the way it works. There's something takes place in your mind before the doubt is sowed in the mind. The confusion comes in the mind. The backsliding takes place in the mind. And when it has conceived, then it brings forth sin. But she is a force, a virtuous woman with the same character as her husband. Because Boaz and Ruth had the same character. What is that strength? He only did what the Father showed him. He knew the word and he knew what he wanted done with the word and that's what he did. And it made him invincible. If they get a true revelation of the two spirits within the framework of the Christian church and by God's spirit discern and withstand the Antichrist spirit, Satan will be powerless before her. He will be as definitely thwarted today as when Christ withstood his every effort to gain power over him in the desert. Yes, Satan hates revelation, but we love it. With true revelation in our lives, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, but we will prevail over them. How many times have you heard that quote? 50, 100, 200, 300, and it gets better every time I hear it. I could hear it every day, 10 times a day. I need a little keychain fob where I'm feeling low. I'll just push this again and listen to this again and let it play back. Because this is our promise for this day. Hallelujah. Now he says, if she can catch this revelation and she can withstand it, Satan will be def as definitely thwarted today as he was when he tried to gain victory over him in the desert. And so how, how in this warfare that was taking place in the desert during Jesus' temptation in the desert, how during this great battle that was taking place between Satan and Jesus, how did he defeat him as an invincible man of valor? It is written. He didn't punch him in the face. He didn't spit at him. He didn't insult him. Amen. He didn't stomp up and down and say, I'm stomping on your head. He didn't scream. He, didn't. he said, it is written. And the devil brings another tactic. And what is the devil doing? Using the word inappropriately. Misplacing it. Amen. Misconstruing it. He's taking it out of context. And he's trying to get him to jump onto something else, but it, it move him out of the manifestation for his day. Move him away from his calling, his word that's being brought forth in that day. He's trying to turn him from his commission by what? By using scriptures. Is that what the devil used? And, and Jesus didn't have to insult him. He didn't have to scream really loud. All he had to do was say, it is written. Resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Hallelujah. And if we can catch that same revelation of the word and use it the same way, he will be as definitely thwarted today as he was when he tried to gain the victory over him in the wilderness. We don't have to shout, don't have to scream. Hey, if we shout and scream, that's wonderful. When he runs away and our deliverance has come, shout and scream and rejoice. But it doesn't take shouting and screaming. Amen? It doesn't take, amen, it doesn't take, it doesn't even take an all-night prayer meeting. If you need to pray to build faith, then pray. But all it takes is faith in the Word. That's it, period. Hallelujah. 
Nothing wrong with praying. Pray until you break through. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen? But so, sometimes we need to realize it's not the praying a long time that does it. Amen? The only, thing, the only reason we're waiting on the Lord and laying on, waiting on the Lord is to catch a revelation so that we can have victory, so that our faith gets to a point where we can reach out and take a hold of it. But any time your faith is to a point where you can believe the word and stand on it, you can have it. It's not the length of prayer. It is not the, the process that we go through. It's faith in the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Branham says in the message, the restoration of the bride tree. He said four killers took it. And he's talking about the palmer worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the, the, the canker worm, and the locust. Brother Branham talks about these, these four insects came in and they're four stages of the same insect and begin to eat down the bride tree that bloomed forth at Pentecost and eat it down, amen, and it came down in four stages and Brother Branham's going to show us that he's going to restore it in four stages. So he said four killers took it, four messengers destroyed it, four messengers of death took it away and dogmas. Four messengers of righteousness restore her back again. Prophesy, son of man. So now he's going to take this prophecy in Joel, and in Joel he says, I will restore, Joel 2, 25, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. That word army, you guessed it. Same word as virtue, same word as whatever, you know. Which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God and hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So Brother Bram's going to take this prophecy out of Joel chapter 2, and the prophecy out of Ezekiel 37, and he's going to tie them together in the same event. He's going to make it the same thing for the bride. He says, he said, four messengers of righteousness restore her back. Prophesy, son of man, can these bones live? Wish we had time. I got it wrote down here, but I have to miss that. Prophesy, can these bones live? Watch the four stages of that coming forth of the church. Watch the four stages of Ezekiel's dry bones coming forth. But the life only come, not when the sinew skin was on them, but when the wind blowed upon them, that's when it come back, that fourth message of life. So he four tore it down. He said four brought it back. Hallelujah. That fourth message of life. I will restore, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise be to God. The fourth light is to come that will bring forth the same signs. Justification brought back the pulp. Sanctification brought back the bark, doctrine of holiness. What brought back the leaf? Pentecostals. What is it? Pentecostals. Leaves. Clap their hands. Joy. Rejoicing. Pentecostal. What? The fourth was the word itself. So he's talking about four stages of restoration after it was eight down. It came back through Luther's age, amen, justification. Wethley's age, sanctification. Pentecostal age, baptism of the Holy Ghost. But then it's got to come to the fourth stage, the fourth message of light, which is what? The word itself. And that's the thing that gives the army its life. That's the prophecy that comes forth from a prophet, amen, that breathes life into the mighty army. The, the fourth was the word itself. The word made flesh, fruits of the proof of the resurrection sign that Christ has finally, after justification been planted, sanctification been planted, baptism of the Holy Ghost, organizations died out, and Christ has again centered himself like that cap of the pyramid First line, justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost, then coming of the cap. Yeah. Well, it shows us that the capstone coming is the fourth message of life and the fourth message of light. Is that right? The capstone coming is he himself. It's the word, and it's the thing that brings life to the mighty army. The funny thing is, is he preached this before the seals. He preached this in April 22nd of 1962, the restoration of the bride tree. He knows that that bride tree is going to be restored. How is she going to be restored? She's got four stages of restoration. She's got to come through justification, sanctification, 
baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he knew he was there in the Pentecostal age, but he knew something else had to come, and that cap of the pyramid had to come. And that was going to be the thing that capped it off. In the masterpiece in 64, he says, and, and the life that was in the stalk went, one went to make the other. Justification made a way for sanctification. Sanctification made a way for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost made a way for the Holy Ghost itself to come right down in perfection back to the Word again to manifest itself. Now, he says in, in Revelation chapter 5 from 61, he says, now down doing the kinsman redeeming, we have the earnest of the right now waiting for the time that when he comes back. And then, what next thing Ruth was, Ruth was rewarded. So Brother Branham takes four stages of Ruth's journey. Four stages of the palmer worm, can worm, caterpillar, locust. Four stages down, four stages back, tying, tying it together with Ezekiel. Now he goes to four stages in Ruth. You have Ruth deciding, and he types that with justification. He has Ruth, amen, working working out her salvation with fear and trembling, he types that with the sanctification. He said Lutheran age, Wesleyan age. Then he has a promise. Boaz gives her a promise and says, I'll do all unto you that you require. And he says, then she moves into rest, amen, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So now Ruth has moved through justification, Luther's age, sanctification, Wesley's age, and now she's moved through the Pentecostal age, but now there's got to come something else has to take place. And he says, it's Ruth rewarded. Ruth already got her rest. She's resting, waiting, resting, waiting, resting, waiting. What's she resting and waiting for? She's waiting for her reward. And what is her reward? Boaz himself. Amen. Not Boaz just as the man who owns the field. Not Boaz as the one who was kind to her and gave her gifts. Not Boaz as the one who handed her parched corn. Not Boaz as the one that sent reapers to look after him. Amen. That would drop handfuls of purpose in the ministry so she could pick it up. Not just the one who owned the field. Not just the one who showed her kindness. Not just the one who made her a promise. It wasn't the promise. It wasn't the field. It wasn't the barley. Now the fourth stage, her reward was Boaz himself. Hallelujah. Amen. If she would have stopped with resting, amen, redemption wouldn't have been complete. And what's the next thing to Ruth was? Ruth was rewarded. That's what the church did. It entered into justification under Luther. Then it went into sanctification under Wesley. Went into the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the last days. And now resting with the earnest of our inheritance that we know that something happened in us. We've passed from death into life and waiting, groaning with nature for that time when we will receive an immortal life, an immortal fullness. Our bodies will be redeemed. Everything's redeemed. We're just waiting from him to return back from the gate. Amen. That's what Ruth was rewarded. That's when we'll be rewarded. So now he's before the seals in 1961, in June of 1961, and he's talking about Ruth will be rewarded when Boaz, he's waiting for Boaz to come back with the gates, amen, from the gates, and we're waiting for our, our, mortal, our immortal fullness, our bodies that will be redeemed when he comes back from the gate, and he's talking about the coming of Christ. And then what? Ruth was rewarded, that's when, that's when we'll be rewarded. Now listen to what he says next. That's what the seven-sealed book is going to open to us. What? Your reward. Your rewarding time. What's your reward? He himself. Amen. He's going to return as the full word and unite with his bride. What's the fourth stage? He himself. What's her reward? Boaz. What's your reward? Christ himself, amen, coming in the fullness of his word to unite with his body, the headship and the body uniting together, amen. That's your reward. Hallelujah. That's more than a sensation. That's more than something that, 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 that a feeling. That's reality, friends. He said that's what the seven-sealed book is going to open to us. He's prophesying her rewarding time it's going to be open to her in the seven seal book. Back in Kinsman Redeemer, he says, now, this is 1960, now what did they do? 
they got married. He's referring to Boaz and Ruth. They got married and through that come his great thing. Then Ruth was rewarded by getting Christ or getting Boaz for her husband. That was Ruth's reward, getting Boaz. Which the church is rewarded when the coming of the Lord shall come on the bright and cloudless morning. We're resting, waiting now. It shall come. And Brother Ram saying this before the seals. Now we're going to take a look after the seals. We're going to look in 1964 at proving his word. And he says, and Jesus says, as it was in the days of Sodom, now watch close. In the days of Sodom, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man, when the Son of Man is being revealed. Now, Brother Bram told us that Ruth's reward was Boaz as her husband, uniting with her husband. He was her reward. Now he says there's coming, the Son of Man is being revealed, not no more as a church, see, not no more. The bride is called, see. In that day, the Son of Man will be revealed, what? To join the church to the head. That's what the revealing of the Son of Man was for. To, to join the church to the head, unite the marriage of the bride. That's what the Son of Man ministry came to do, to unite the marriage of the bride. The bridegroom call will come right through this when the Son of Man will come down and come in human flesh to unite the two together. The church has to be the word. He is the word, and the two unites together. She has to have the same virtue he has. Boaz and Ruth had the same character, and they came together. She was the word. She has to be the word. The two unite together. And to do that, it'll take the manifestation of the revealing of the Son of Man. Not a clergyman. I don't know. Do you see what I mean? It's a Son of Man. Jesus Christ will come down in human flesh among us and will make his word so real that it'll unite the church and him as one, the bride, and then she'll go home to the wedding supper. Amen? She's already united. See, we go to the wedding supper, not to the marriage. Hear that? What did the ministry of the Son of Man, God himself coming down in human flesh, what was it supposed to do? Make the word so real that it will unite the head and the body together into what? Into a a union, into a marriage, amen. He says, she's already united. See, we go to the wedding supper, not to the marriage. Fill your flesh, fill yourself of all the flesh of mighty men because the marriage of the Lamb has come. But the rapture is going to the wedding supper. When the word here unites with the person, then they and they too become one. And then what does it do then? It manifests the Son of Man again. Not the church theologians, the Son of Man. The word and the church become one. What did the seven seal book open up to us? Our reward. It lets us see that our reward came. He made redemption at the gates and now he come forth in the fullness of his word. To what? Word coming to unite with word. To what? To marry her. Ruth rewarded. What? In the fourth stage, Ruth was rewarded. Brother Benham says in the Feast of Trumpets, he said the Holy Spirit has been bound by these denominational rivers for almost 2,000 years but it's to be loosed in the evening time by the evening time message, the Holy Spirit back in the church again. Christ himself revealed in human flesh in the evening time. He said he promised it. There was three stages of it. Now he's gonna talk about three stages of what? Three stages of this coming through the church. The martyr's age. And the martyr's age lasted all the way till Thyatira. And that's the first stage. The second stage, is the reformer's age, and there was three, amen, three phases of the Reformation, or the, Brother Bram calls the third Reformation was the Pentecostal revival. And so the Reformation goes Luther, Wesley, Pentecost, all right? And now, the calling out time. There was three stages. There was the martyr's age, up through Thyatira, when they gave their lives. Then there's the reformer's age, Luther, Wesley. Then the, third, then the third phase or third stage of the Reformation is the Pentecostal revival. But after that Pentecostal revival, now it's calling out time. Ruth is being called out to unite with Boaz. 
Brother Rev says in the message, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. 1963, notice the vindicated word in his body. Oh, you've got to listen close. The vindicated word in his body. Where is his body? We, the bride of Jesus Christ, the elect redeemed seed around the world is his body. The vindicated word in his body is his very victory and the reason of his death. (laughs) See, the death, not in the spirit. When he died, he only died in the flesh. His spirit went to hell and preached to the souls in prison. That's right. His flesh only died. Then he raised it up again and quickened it. Quickened means made alive. His flesh, which was his body, that's the word. It's been laying dead for years. That flesh died. Men hung on a cross, was nailed to a cross. That flesh, which was what? The word made flesh. The body word. It died. It went to a grave. His spirit didn't die. It went to the souls and priests in prison. But now he come back and he quickened that body to life and brought it up. And now Brother Branham is typing that again. And he says now, he says, he says now, and that's the word. His body, that's the word. It's been laying dead for years. But it gradually began to come in the Reformation. And now she's standing upon her feet. What's he saying? It's come through Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, amen? It's come through the stages, amen? It's come through these stages, and now she's standing upon her feet. Oh, how I wish I had time to go back into Ezekiel and pull out them dry bones and show you. He said, can these bones live again? He said, prophesy. How can prophecy come? Only through the prophet. It's the word of the Lord. Hear ye dry bones, the word of the Lord, and sinew, skin came upon them, and they stood up a mighty army and began to march towards Zion. Glory to God, that's him, that's him, the victory. He proves his resurrection life, then as he vindicates himself, she, the bride, is independent from all others. She's an independent woman. (laughs) I like to say she's a virtuous woman. She's an invincible army. She's predestinated to be an invincible army as she catches the revelation and catches the revelation. She's becoming more and more and more into what he's already spoke she will be, an invincible army. A virtuous woman, an independent woman. Not independent from the word, not independent from the spirit of God. No, independent from everything else. She's broke every other tie. She's broke everything else. And now she's only connected with one thing, and that's him. Which is what? Her reward. She's an independent woman, a great speckled bird that's different from all others. Remember the Bible on that, that great speckled bird, but she had his name. She had his life. For how did they speckle the bird? They were both white, and then they pulled the head off of one bird and drained the blood out upon the other bird. And the other bird was speckled with the red blood, and it flopped its wings like this, and the blood cried, holy, 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 as it bathed the ground. So Christ, the dead mate, put his blood, his blood from his life, into us. Carrying his blood, crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. It's an odd-looking bird, sure it is. She, the bride, is identified by him, and she is independent from all others. He identified, she's identified by him. Just like Boaz identified Ruth, you are a virtuous woman. The whole city knows you are a virtuous woman. And she was, and now the bride is identified by him, and she is independent from all others. Keep thee only unto her as long as you both live. Keep thee only to him. The word, no adultery, not one sign of denomination, not one sign of creed, no adultery at all. The word and him alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's it, Christ the word, he was the word, he is the word, and the church becomes the word by him making her part of him, and that's the word again. Personally identified by him, his property alone, his property alone, she is redeemed by him, through him, for him, and for him alone, that's right, then what the devil is howling about? That it's being revealed. What's the devil mad about? That you're catching the revelation. 
That's what he's howling about. That's why he's building up systems to shut this down is because you and I are catching the revelation that we're not weak and we're not beggarly, amen. That's describing my flesh. But when I look on the inside, amen, that life that's been quickened by the Spirit of God, by the Word of the Lord, that thing, that thing inside of me is the same thing that God is, only a piece of it. Whatever Christ was, she has to be the same thing. Christ was fearless when it came to the word. He was fearless in the face of the devil. He was fearless in all of those things. She's got to be the same thing. He had virtue, she has virtue. He's a mighty man of valor, she's a mighty woman of valor. Amen. He's a warrior, she's a warrior. Brother Branham said in the signs of his coming, he said, what is it? It was a body growing from feet, coming up. He's talking about through Luther, through Wesley. He's talking about this coming up through the church. He keeps going back to the same thing. He ties it to Ezekiel's dry bones, the restoration of the bride tree, the four stages. He's always going back and repeating the same thing. It was a body growing from the feet, coming up, coming up more, more important parts of the body from the feet. So he starts talking about, he also tights it with the stages of grain. You know, you have the blade, and then you, then you have the tassel, and then you have the husk. But the fourth stage is the life again, amen. back to the wheat. So it's always got to move to that fourth stage, amen. Back to the wheat. And it's, it's grown up the body from the feet on into the lungs and the heart, on into the head. Who is the head? Who is the head? Christ. That's the intelligence. How's the money move? By the head. And get this. And the government shall be upon his what? His shoulders. What is his shoulders? His body. There's where the real, there's where the real true church speaks in this power. There's where the apostolic power returns to the church when the government shall be upon his shoulders. Judgment. The government is the rulership or the dominion. And when the head comes down, where does it go? to the shoulders, and that is the ruler, that is the government, that is the dominion, that is the king, uniting with his queen. Amen. Spoken word is the original seed, he says, and the Bible said it would, he said, is that right, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, a son is given, his name shall be called counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting father, and of his kingdom there shall be no end, and the government shall be upon his what? Shoulders, that's the part of his body, that's his body, isn't it? His shoulders is his body. Where is the government on earth at? In his body. Saints shall judge the earth, that's right. <clears throat> I dare you to go to court with one another and not take it before the church, right? See, saints shall judge the earth. Where is the government going to be upon? Upon the shoulders, his body. The government upon his shoulders, that's a part of the body. What is it? His earthly strength. Listen, virtue means strength. His earthly strength, God's earthly strength, is his word made flesh in his body here on earth, bringing it to pass. God's earthly strength, his government, his rulership is where? It came down and united with the body, and now the government is in his body, his earthly strength. God's earthly strength is his word made flesh in his body, and who is his body? The many-membered bride is his body. That's what makes her a virtuous woman. That's what makes her an army. That's what makes her a terrible as an army with banners is because his earthly strength is in his body. His earthly strength is his word made flesh in his body, and that's what makes her strong. That's what makes her powerful. That's what makes her a force. That's what makes her an invincible army. He came in this day to identify who we were. And he said, not that you're Chad and you're Bob and you're all that. No, you're a virtuous woman. I am? You're strong. You're as terrible as an army with banners. Who, me? He was looking at more than your face. Boaz was looking at more than Ruth's face. He was looking at more than Ruth's figure. He was looking at more than Ruth's bank account. He was looking at more than Ruth's ability. He was looking at her character. 
And God came down looking for character, somebody that can make a clear-cut decision and stay with the word. And when he saw somebody that could make a clear-cut decision and stay with the word, he fell in love with her like Boaz did and said, that's a virtuous woman. I'll do all that I said and all that you require, you rest and I'll do it. Hallelujah, what a blessed place to be. Amen. I'm gonna read one last scripture. If you can turn with me to Proverbs 31. <clears throat> Proverbs 31 and 29. Proverbs 31, 29. <clears throat> Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. There's many that done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. That word virtuously is the same word. That means strength, force, might, power, virtue, valor. There's many that's been good. There's many that done good. But this end time bride is called to excel us them all. To be the very manifestation of Christ in a many membered body upon the earth. Christ in the formation of the bride. And she is a virtuous woman. She is a woman of valor. She is a force. She is an army. She is a host. She is all those words that describe that, Greek, that Hebrew word. She is all of that because she is him. Not by her own choosing, but by his choosing. They're called, the called, and the chosen before the foundation of the world, and the faithful by their own choosing. He chose you, and you chose him back. He chose you, and you made your clear-cut decision. He chose you before the foundation of the world, but you had to make your clear-cut decision and say, this is the way I'm going to walk. And you had to walk in that way. And proving what character was there. That's why the bride is a virtuous woman. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you come in, Brother Joe, you make your way up. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We appreciate so much, Lord, how you just break down your word for us and give it to us, Lord, bite after bite after bite. And you keep showing us, Lord, there's things that you want us to see. And Lord, there's a confidence that you want to come in, not into us and our human minds and not into us and our human bodies, but have confidence in that predestinated plan that you have. Have confidence in that seed that sprung to life. Lord, that's you, Lord, working and moving through us. God, we just declare right now that we've made our clear-cut decision to follow after you, and we believe what you said about us. And Lord, we receive you as our portion, Lord. I pray, God, that if there's any here who have not united with you, Lord, that they would reunite with you now, Lord. God, that they would join in with you and receive, Lord, what you're telling them in this hour, that they would receive it, they, they would accept it, Lord, that they would walk in the revelation of it, that you would quicken the seeds to life, Lord. We love you, God, and we thank you for what you've done, what you will do, Lord, and just make us a part of your plan. Lord, if you called us virtuous, if you called us like an army with banners, then you're gonna have to perform it, Lord. We're willing to give you our lives, but we're trusting you to keep your word in and through us, Lord. We submit ourselves to you, Lord, and ask that you would do exceedingly and above all that we could ask or think. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. I hope you don't ever read that scripture about a virtuous woman the same way. She's more than just moral. moral. She's more than just pure. She's also strong. She's also a force. Praise the Lord. You have a song, brother. Yeah, that's good. We'll sing this song as we allow you to be dismissed. God bless you. God is good, friends. Amen. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus.
Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus. 